There are three distinctions of great importance in philosophy, which I just want to introduce briefly in this video. These distinctions apply to propositions, and they are distinction between necessary and contingent propositions, the distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions, and the distinction between a priori and a posteriori propositions. Firstly, then, the distinction between necessary and contingent. Uh, so, necessity. Um, a necessarily true proposition is one that could not have been false, and a contingently true proposition is one that could have been false. Um, fairly simple idea there. Uh, so if you imagine that you're given the power to change the universe in any way you like, uh, you can you know, alter it and have the power of a god to just alter it however you want. Well, uh, a necessarily true proposition is one that would be true no matter how radically you change the nature of the world. doesn't matter what you do, you can't change a necessarily true proposition into a false one. You can only change the contingently true propositions. So, the way philosophers think about necessity and contingency is by using the notion of possible worlds. Um, a possible world is just a way our world might have been, where world refers to the entire universe, not just our planet. Possible worlds are alternative uh, universes. Now, they don't actually exist, of course, they're only possible, um, but there's a possible world in which the Nazis won the war. There's a possible world uh, that consists of nothing but a single talking donkey. There's a possible world exactly like our world, except the Andromeda galaxy is about a mile further left. For every way our world could have been, there's a corresponding possible world. Uh, so there's no possible world in which Santa Claus both does and does not exist, since that would be contradictory, and hence impossible. That's not a way our world could have been. Um, so we can use possible worlds to think about possibility, and we say that a necessarily true proposition is a proposition that is true in every possible world. Uh, and a contingently true proposition is true in our world, but false in some possible worlds. So um, 1 plus 1 equals 2, well, that's true in every possible world you might like to visit. Whereas uh, my car is parked outside, that's false in plenty of worlds. Maybe I don't have a car, maybe I don't even exist in some worlds. So, uh, I mean, I think that's very simple. This is a very familiar distinction. There's nothing too difficult here. Um, just some examples of necessary truths. 1 plus 1 equals 2. All triangles have three sides. Either Bob is dead or it is not the case that Bob is dead, and so on. Some contingent truths. Uh, Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on Earth. I mean, you. Th this is very simple stuff, I think. It's uh, a relatively familiar. Uh, well, how about the analytic synthetic distinction. An analytic proposition um, is one that is true in virtue of its meaning. So that the truth of an analytic proposition is determined entirely by its meaning. And with the synthetic propositions, uh, truth is a function not just of its meaning, but of the way the world is. So the truth of a synthetic proposition is determined not just by its meaning, but by the way the world is. Now, a, a paradigm example of an analytic proposition is all bachelors are unmarried. This is analytic because bachelor is simply defined as unmarried man. The, the definition of bachelor is unmarried man, so it's part of the meaning of bachelor that all bachelors are unmarried. We could say that if you disagree that all bachelors are unmarried, you simply don't understand what the word bachelor means. Um, Another example might be all triangles have three sides. Again, having three sides, that's just part of the definition of triangle. I mean, that's what a triangle is. So you can see then that the truths of those propositions is determined entirely by the meanings of the words that they contain. On the other hand, consider all bachelors are unhappy. Well, even if you think that this proposition is true, clearly unhappiness is not part of the definition of bachelor. Uh, another example would be the solar system contains eight planets. Um, it's obvious that our definition of solar system 
doesn't compel us to posit any particular number of, of planets. Um, we once had nine planets, after all. With the proposition that the solar system contains eight planets, well, the truth of this proposition is clearly partially determined by the way our world is. It's by the nature of the solar system. It's not just about the meanings of the words. Now, uh, an important way of phrasing the uh, analytic synthetic distinction was provided by Kant. Um, he defined it this way. Uh, an analytic proposition is a proposition whose predicate concept is contained within its subject concept, and a synthetic proposition is a proposition whose predicate concept is not contained within its subject concept. So the idea is that the predicate concept, unmarried, in all bachelors are unmarried, is in some sense contained in the subject concept, bachelor. Now the concept of unhappiness does not seem to be so contained. Uh, that was Kant's way. I mean, we'll see later that there are, uh, you know, there are problems with with trying to define the analytic synthetic distinction in quite this way. Um, uh, that's not necessarily how it's defined in modern philosophy. So, a priori, a posteriori. Right. Uh, a priori propositions are propositions that can be known independently of experience. So. This is about how we come to know things. It's about how we how we accumulate our knowledge. And in order to come to know an a priori proposition, we don't need to consult the external world. We can just sit on an armchair and think about it. Uh, that's sufficient. That's all we have to do to know the truth of an a priori proposition. It might be very difficult to, um, to know its truth, but we can in principle do it just in our heads. Uh, a posteriori propositions uh, can be known only on the basis of experience, or rather, they can be known only with recourse to experience. Of course, when we're thinking about a priori propositions, we may well be, um, you know, using the sort of mental machinery, but we're going to have to consult the external world, consult our experience um, at some point in order to come to know them. Um, so. Uh, a priori truths include uh, propositions such as all bachelors are unmarried, again, uh, all triangles have three sides. Again, you can see that with each of these, with all bachelors are unmarried, because bachelor is defined as unmarried man, it's clear that we don't need to consult the external world, we don't need to consult our experience to see that all bachelors are unmarried, or all triangles have three sides. As long as we understand the concept of a triangle, it's clear that all triangles have three sides. And that a priori propositions would also include mathematical truths such as you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, or logical truths such as the law of non-contradiction, and so on. A posteriori truths include Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on Earth, or the solar system contains eight planets, and so on. Uh, now, important thing to note here, again, a priori propositions, it might be very, very difficult to come to know them uh, just by, you know, working them out in your head. So with a mathematical uh, problem like 567 times 391, well, it, it might take you a very, very long time to figure that one out in your head. It might be a lot easier to just go to a calculator and, um, you know, look, look it up on there. But the point is that, in principle, you, you could do it just sitting down uh, on your armchair, just thinking about it. Um, also note that with a priori, a priori truths, uh, experience may be required in acquiring the concepts. Um, the idea is that once you have the concepts, you don't need to consult experience to know their relations. Uh, so, for example, you have to learn the words all and bachelors and are and unmarried and learning those words obviously requires experience. You could, you're not going to learn those words without you know, a sort of community of, of speakers, of language speakers and so on. You're not born with those words. The point is that having learnt those words, we can see the, the truth of all bachelors are unmarried without recourse to further experience. And that's also true of sort of mathematical truths. Once you uh, learn the basic concept of, of numbers, you can figure out things like 678 times 900 
just in your head without any more experience and obviously that's not I mean it's probably not something that you will have been directly taught right uh, so those are the three distinctions You'll note that in explicating these distinctions, I used similar or the same examples for each one. Uh, this was no accident. Many philosophers have supposed that uh, these three distinctions are coextensive. Uh, that is, they, that each distinction divides propositions in the same way. So, the necessary propositions are the analytic propositions, are the a priori propositions. They they all are the same, uh, and the contingent propositions are the synthetic propositions, are the a posteriori propositions. So if a proposition is synthetic, it's contingent and a posteriori. If a proposition is a priori, you know that it's analytic and necessary. Um, looking at the examples we've given so far, you might think that that's, um, that, that is the case. Uh, so with that said, do we really need three distinctions? Well, firstly, you have to note that these three distinctions are all about different things. Um, the first distinction, necessary contingent, is metaphysical. It's about the nature of the world. It's about possibilities and modalities and so on. On the other hand, analytic synthetic is semantic. So this one's about the meanings of our words, symbols, language. And finally, the a priori, a posteriori distinction is epistemic. It's to do with our knowledge. It's to do with how we acquire knowledge. So even if these distinctions are coextensive, we can see that there's some reason to keep in mind that they, that they are separate. They pertain to different areas of inquiry. Um, now, in any case, although they might look, ex look coextensive, there are a number of objections to this view. So... Uh, Let's take a look at some of those. Can we have synthetic a priori propositions? Can there be propositions that are true not just by virtue of their meaning but also by virtue of the way the world is that can also be known independently of any experience of the world? How could that, how could that be the case? A prima facie, th this does look like a rather odd claim, but it's not immediately contradictory. Um, a traditional defence of synthetic a priori knowledge would be that it's been given to us by God. Uh, the idea is that there are certain basic truths about the world, uh, such as truths about the geometry of the world, or truths such as every event has a cause, that are, that are given to us by God, or at least uh, God has given us the innate capacity in our minds to discover them independently of experience so that we can have a priori understanding of them. Now, of course, uh, this kind of argument isn't likely to be popular these days. Uh, a more famous kind of uh, perspective uh, was offered by Kant. Kant held a somewhat unusual view because he held that the propositions of arithmetic and geometry are synthetic a priori. Uh, and above, I mentioned that these are good examples of analytic propositions. Kant disagreed. So, why might these be considered synthetic? Well, just consider, just consider this. It's, it can be extraordinarily difficult to generate logical and mathematical theorems. Uh, a relatively simple example might be 12 times 14 equals 168. Now, in this case, right, I can fully understand 12. I can fully understand 14. And I can fully understand the notion of multiplication. So in this sense, then, I can, I can fully understand the concept on the left side of the equality. And despite that, I, I don't see that the right side follows. Uh, it's not immediate to me that, the, that the, uh, the right side does follow from the left. I have to work it out, so I have to think about it. 12 times 14 equals 168, is that right? It may take me some time to work out that this proposition is correct. So... Kant would say that the concept 168 is not contained in the concept 12 times 14. So the proposition 12 times 14 equals 168 is not analytic. But of course it's clearly a priori. We don't have to consult experience to check its truth. We can work it out in our heads. So that's a possible example. But 
You must note that this really turns on Kant's particular definition of the analytic synthetic distinction. There is a difference between statements that are true in virtue of their meaning, or true by definition, and statements that are true in virtue of the fact that their predicate concept is contained in their subject concept. At least there's arguably a difference there. Um, indeed, if you look at the history of the analytic synthetic distinction, you'll see that, uh, especially with the development of modern formal logic, Kant's definition has been quite widely rejected. So there is a, a difference between the first definition I gave of the analytic synthetic distinction and Kant's definition. It seems quite you know, reasonable to say that 12 times 14 equals 168 is synthetic on Kant's definition, but I, I'm really not at all sure that the same could be said if we're using the modern definitions. And in modern philosophy it's the former that tends to be preferred. So a more persuasive example might be if x is blue all over then x is not red all over. Now on the one hand this seems to be a priori. When we consider what it means to be blue we can see without consulting experience that the same surface could not at once be both blue and red at the same time. Um, but arguably this statement is not analytic. Is not red part of the definition of blue? Uh, in fact it's questionable whether blue even has a definition. Um, you know, there's a classic problem of explaining a colour or defining a colour beyond simply pointing to it. Um, so arguably then this is, this is synthetic but a priori, arguably. Okay, so let's consider the necessary a posteriori. So these are statements that are necessarily true, but that we, we have to rely on experience to come to know. We can't just work it out in our heads. Here's an example from Saul Kripke. We know that gold has the atomic number 79. Uh, now this is something we discovered through experience. We had to conduct experiments uh, without which there'd be no way of coming to know it. But it's necessary that gold has the atomic number 79. Anything with that atomic number is gold, even if it doesn't superficially look like gold, and anything with a different atomic number is not gold, even if it looks very much like gold. Uh, after all, we, we know that gold and the substance with the atomic number 79 are identical, so gold necessarily has the atomic number 79. This kind of argument depends on essential versus accidental properties. Um, now, an essential property is a property an object must have in order to be that object. An accidental property is a property an object has but could lack without compromising the fundamental identity of the object. So the idea is that being the atomic number 79 is in some sense essential to being gold, while um, being, I don't know, shiny is just accidental. Um, so let's consider this, uh, this distinction. Uh, Take the statement, Kripke is a university professor. Now, surely it's not an essential property of Kripke that he be a university professor. He wasn't a university professor when he was five years old, but he was still Kripke. Um, and indeed, he would continue to be Kripke even if he stopped being a professor. So being a university professor must be an accidental property of Kripke. If Kripke were to, if were to lose that property, it wouldn't threaten his identity. He would still be Kripke. But now think about Kripke as a human. Well, that's arguably essential. If something isn't human, then it can't be Kripke, we might, we might say. I'll just note that, in my opinion, this distinction is complete bunkum, but it's worth being aware of it, and the upshot of it is that we can say uh, that it arguably allows us to have necessary a posteriori truths, um, like gold and the number 79 there. So, next, the contingent a priori. So, these are truths which are false in some possible worlds, but which we can nevertheless work out in our heads. These are things that could have been false, um, but that we don't need to consult experience to check that they're true. That's a bit strange, perhaps. Well, here's Kripke again. Suppose we set up a system of measurement like this. We take a stick, what we'll call X, and we'll say that X is one crip, uh, abbreviated 1K, that's uh, an imaginary unit. Uh, it's one crip long. 
Well, we know a priori that x is 1k long. We didn't have to investigate the world and take measurements of the stick. We've simply stipulated by definition that it's 1k long. But it's not necessary that x is 1k long. It's only contingent that it's 1k long. x could have been longer or shorter than it is, um, in which case it wouldn't be 1k because 1k is the length of the actual stick x. Um, the, the way of thinking about this is in the possible world where x is longer than it is in our world, x is not 1k long. Um, okay, so perhaps that's a contingent a priori truth. Similar example comes from Gareth Evans. Suppose we're having a discussion about zips and we find ourselves frequently using the phrase the inventor of the zip. This phrase is quite big and clunky, so we decide to use the name Julius to refer to this same person. Now, we are stipulating just by definition that the name Julius refers to whoever invented the zip. So it's a priori that Julius invented the zip, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary that he invented the zip. He might have died before coming up with the idea. He might have taken a career as a florist rather than an inventor. Uh, any number of things could have happened to Julius. Perhaps another contingent a priori truth. Julius invented the zip. Well, um, you might feel that there's a bit of trickery, a bit of philosophical sleight of hand going on in these examples. Because what does Julius mean? Julius means it's simply an abbreviation for the inventor of the zip. That's what we've just stipulated. Now let's take our supposedly contingent a priori proposition. Um, Julius invented the zip. Surely we should be able to substitute the name for the longer description it abbreviates. So the inventor of the zip invented the zip. But this can be read as being necessarily true. So perhaps it's not contingent a priori after all. Um, note that the issue here is not simply that Julius and the inventor of the zip refer to the same thing. The issue is that we've just stipulated Julius as an abbreviation for the inventor of the zip. Julius has, at least in this context, precisely the same meaning as the inventor of the zip. So that's why it's perfectly legitimate to perform this kind of substitution. Okay, so, I mean, that's just something to uh, think about there. Um, now, we've seen some arguments that the distinctions are not coextensive, uh, but some people have questioned whether the distinctions are tenable at all. Um, w. V. Quine, in particular, is famous for his arguments against the analytic-synthetic distinction, but I don't really want to explore Quine's argument here. Instead, I'll take a simpler example. Um, so we're going to question whether it's really possible to draw the, the analytic synthetic distinction, whether it, uh, it's really possible to demarcate analytic statements from synthetic ones. Consider the famously falsified proposition, all swans are white. Let's go back to the time when they first discovered black swans. Let's call the moment at which they discovered black swans uh, time t. That was the moment at which black swans were discovered. We're calling that time t. So before t, every swan that anybody had encountered had been white. Uh, they, they all assumed that the, the proposition all swans are white was true. Now, uh, here's the point. The, the way this story is usually told is people thought that all swans were white, but then they discovered a black swan. Um, that's a simple story, but it isn't really true. What they discovered was a bird that very strongly resembled a swan in many ways, but that was black instead of white. Um, so people thought that all swans were white, and then they discovered a bird that very, very much resembled a, a swan. It's perhaps like a swan in every single way, except that it's black instead of white. And at this point, there were really two options open here. They could have... Uh, either one said that they've discovered a black swan, which is what happened, or two said that they've discovered a very swan-like black bird. Um, in other words, uh, they could have simply stipulated 
that whiteness is part of the definition of swan, so that anything that isn't white can't be a swan, uh, ignoring situations like somebody painting a swan black. And what's notable here is that if you were to ask people before time t to define swan, they may well have said uh, a white bird related to geese and ducks and so on. The point is that before time t, whiteness was arguably part of the definition of a swan for, for some people at least. Um, well, in, in that case then, all swans are white. It was simply analytic, true in virtue of meaning for those people, for those people who would have held whiteness as being part of the definition of swan. And what that means is that when black swan-like birds were discovered, that didn't falsify the statement all swans are white. Rather what happened is that we, we altered ever so slightly our definition of swan, our concept of swans changed, or uh, rather the concept changed for some people. For others, of course, whiteness wasn't part of the definition of swan, so there was no need to change the concept. Instead, the original proposition that all swans are white was straightforwardly falsified. But for some people, for those people who would have held that whiteness is part of the definition of swan, um, the concept of swan changed ever so slightly. Um, so the point of all this then is that all swans are birds is a clear example of an analytic statement. Uh, all swans wake before dawn is a clear example of a synthetic statement and probably false. Uh, in fact, it's surely false. Um, all swans are white? Well, that seems to inhabit this kind of m murky area between these, between these two extremes. Uh, or at least it did up until time t. Because it's unclear whether whiteness uh, is, or rather was, actually part of the definition of swan. Um, so uh, the question you might say is whether whiteness is an essential or an accidental property of a swan. But of course, that depends on how we define swan. And definitions are not strict and absolute. Different people will have slightly different definitions. The point of all this is that it's perhaps not possible to strictly demarcate those propositions that are true in virtue of their meaning and those that, whose truth also depends on the way the world is. So there's just one way of applying a bit of pressure to the analytic synthetic distinction. and Similar comments would apply to the a priori a posteriori distinction, uh, since if all swans are white as true by definition, then it's a priori. Um, right, well, uh, that's just a, a, a very brief, very rapid introduction to three very important concepts. Um, I hope that was, that was informative. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.